Hi class, Dr. Jim here. So in this lecture, we're going to be actually now looking at the plasma membrane that makes up all cells. Now, we can look at both the prokaryotes and eukaryotes, which are hopefully you saw in the previous lectures, and we can look at their plasma membranes. And really, they're the same in both the prokaryotes and eukaryotes. This hasn't changed. And so that's interesting in the evolutionary question that both the prokaryotes and eukaryotes, prokaryotes, if you remember back, came much before about two billion years before the eukaryotes and that membrane really hasn't changed between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes and so today what we're going to look at is the structure and the structure of both of them and so we kind of get an idea of what these things really look like and what they do okay so our objectives today are first finding out what is the fluid mosaic model now if you've taken a science class or a biology class before you may have heard this term being loosely used with the membrane and this is the idea that the membrane actually is fluid or undulates or moves so think of kind of a giant waterbed or maybe a water balloon and how the cell reacts and that it actually moves and it's actually fluid and i'll talk a little bit more about what the fluid mosaic model is in just a minute the other thing we're going to discuss are some of the various components that we see in the cell membrane and these various components and what they are typically we talk about phospholipids the proteins and then maybe sometimes cholesterol and maybe some glycoproteins in there. But the biggest thing is the phospholipids and the proteins that we'll talk about. And then the last thing is how do substances move in and out of the membrane. And so I think that's really important. We're not going to talk solely about transport in this lecture. That's for the next lecture. I'm saving all that wonderful stuff for the next lecture. But this is just kind of giving an introduction of how things move across. And really it's based on the molecule itself depending on size and whether or not it has a charge. And so we'll look more closely at that in a few minutes. All right, so as we look at the plasma membrane, and I could take the plasma membrane from the prokaryote, from a plant cell or an animal cell, and I just chose to do the animal cell because we are animals, we are animal cells, and I think you probably want to get a representation of what your cells look like on the inside. And so really we can look at the different components and those components include the phospholipid, the proteins, and then we also have some of these other things like glycoproteins and glycolipids and things like that. And we'll mention those in just a minute. What I want to hit home is the phospholipid. If you look at the phospholipid on a bilipid membrane, you're going to see that the orientation is pretty much set in stone. And that's due, uh, due to the characteristics of the phospholipid itself. The phospholipid has a head region on it or the phosphate region that likes water. It's hydrophilic. And these lipid tails are hydrophobic. They hate water. And I think you guys probably discussed a lot of this when you, when you, Jill gave her lecture on organic molecules and polarity and things like this. But I'll, I'll rehash that when we get into the individual components. But there's a reason why these always look the same and that's due to the nature of water and how these things react to water. The next thing that we have are proteins and you can have proteins that are either peripheral, which means sit on the membrane or kind of go along the membrane or ones that actually go through the membrane and these are called integral proteins. And so these things actually start on one end and go to the other or sometimes maybe only halfway through in that. And so they have various functions and we're getting into all the different functions that these proteins have in just a moment. But we'll talk uh, briefly about those in, in, in what they do and how they function in the membrane. But you see these scattered throughout. The other thing you see here is the difference between the glycoprotein, which is basically a sugar molecule or sugar molecules. Remember glucose, glyco, it's associated with that and that these sugar molecules are either found on proteins or associated with the lipid themselves and they get this name glycoprotein or glycolipid and you also see these. These are kind of just a variant that we see on these membrane proteins and, and lipids that we see in the membrane. Now I discussed a little and I talked a little bit about the fluid mosaic model just a, a moment ago. And what does that actually mean? What does fluid mosaic mean? Well, mosaic, you think of mosaic tiles. So if you've ever had a project, maybe an art project, or maybe you've gone to the art museum and you looked at mosaics, what you see is pictures 
that are made up of these individual tiles that are different colors and different things and they make into a nice pretty picture. A lot of times you see this of famous people or other things where they take all these little small images and put them together and it's a mosaic and makes into a nice little image. Well, our membranes are very similar to that. If you look at a membrane, and this is a computer, obviously, computer molecule, or computer rendering of a membrane, and you can see all the different colors. We kind of think of the membrane being a mosaic, that it has all these different proteins, these molecules like carbohydrates, glycoproteins, and even though they don't really show color, they are made up of different materials. And so these different materials kind of make up a mosaic, and that's where the mosaic comes from. Now the fluid part comes from is that these proteins can actually move about. So think about like the rubber duck or the rubber duckies that they throw into the river and they all go down the river and you hope that yours makes it across first. Well, these rubber duckies kind of move on this or kind of glide along the water. And that's actually what these proteins do in the membrane. The membranes actually are fluid. They actually allow things to move around in them. And why does that happen? Well, that's because the proteins can get to one side of the cell or to the other by just moving through the membrane. You don't have to orient and change the cell all the way around in order for the cell to respond. It can just move its proteins within the membrane itself. And that's the fluid part. So the fluid mosaic means you got the fluid part because the membrane's fluid allows these things to move around in the membrane and the mosaic part because these different types of proteins and molecules and different types of structures that are found in the protein kind of make up this mosaic and that's where it comes from. And if you'd like to know more about what the fluid mosaic and kind of see this in action and animation, definitely click on this YouTube video. I think it will explain a lot more. And again, it's on a link in my YouTube page. Definitely recommend watching it. And it'll kind of just give you that idea that I talked about, the movement. You can see these proteins moving around. I think it will give you a really cool idea of what's happening. Okay, so let's look at the components now. So what are the components of the membrane? Really, there's three or really two main components, and then there's some other things that are added in that we like to add in for fun. The first thing is the phospholipid. And again, Jill, I think, has done a really good job of talking about phospholipids already, so I won't spend too much time, but I want you to be aware of the two distinct parts. There's the hydrophilic part, which is the the head or the phosphate head part of it, and then you have the hydrophobic region. And the hydrophobic, again, is the lipid part or the oil part. And if you remember to the example, you add oil to a bucket of water or add oil to water, and you always see the oil getting away from the water. Oil hates water. There is a love-hate relationship with oil and water, and that's because the oil is hydrophobic. It hates the water. It wants to get as far away as possible from the water. And the same thing goes with the phospholipid. When you put a phospholipid into water, the phosphate is the part that loves the water. That's going to be oriented to where the water is, and then the lipid is going to try and get as far away as possible from that. And you can kind of see that when we talk about these bi- layer sheets, you can see the phosphate head on one end where the waters are and the lipid tails are away from the water and they always do this. A really cool experiment that you could do in a science class is actually make these phospholipids, they actually sell phospholipids and you can throw them into a glass of water and actually make an artificial cell and these are called liposomes and what they do is they orient themselves and it's based all on the chemistry. The lipids hate the water, so what they'll do is they'll stay away from the water, whereas the phosphate heads will orient themselves to the water. So whether you have water on the inside or water on the outside, these phosphate heads are going to be oriented that way. Now some other components that are found in the membrane itself are these cholesterol molecules. And cholesterol, kind of like what you think about in your blood, the cholesterol kind of thickens the arteries or thickens the blood. Same thing with the membrane. The cholesterol gives the membrane some structure, gives it some rigidity. So it's not a complete watery mess that's going on with the phospholipid but you do have some structure and that's what cholesterol provides. And so cholesterol is important. You don't want to be on a completely correct cholesterol free diet because you do need it for your membranes. But what cholesterol does is it gives it some structure rigidity to it. Now another component and probably the second most important component of a membrane is the proteins. And the reason for these proteins is that really it has a lot of different functions and I'll get to that in just a second. But the proteins provide functions for things to get in and out of the cell. And that is an important part of why we have these things in the cell. 
Now, if you look here on this slide, there's a lot of different types of proteins that we're, we're going to talk about. And I'll briefly mention these in just a minute as you go through in the channel proteins, carriers, cell recognition, receptors, enzymatic, and these tight junctions. But what all these things do is they provide a function for these for these cells, either for the cells or for the proteins in the membranes do something for the cell themselves. And we'll talk more about these in just a second. So what is a channel protein? A channel protein is basically a protein that has a hole. So think of kind of like a donut or a straw. What it allows you to do is get things in and out of the cell really easily because you have this hole that's basically formed inside the membrane that allows things to get through. One of the examples we use in class is called an aquaporin. And an aquaporin allows water to move in and out of the membrane very easily. And so that's an example of a channel protein. The second type of protein is called a carrier protein. And a carrier protein is something that kind of like lends out its hand to a molecule and says, here, I'll help you in. Like if you're going to cross the street and you're going to help a little kid or an old lady across the street, you grab their hand to hold on. And that's what a carrier protein does. It grabs onto the molecule and brings it into the membrane. And so we have a number of different types of carrier proteins that get molecules in and out of the cell itself. Now, another interesting one is the cell recognition protein. Now, you may have heard of this before. It's called an MHC, or maybe in the hospital setting, you may have heard of this as an HLA or human leukocyte antigen or associated protein. And what these are are cell, or cell, cell, they're cell proteins that allow for things to be recognized. So it tells your body that, yes, you are you. And this is important, especially when we talk about transplants because we have to match these proteins up with the person we're putting these organs into. Otherwise, the body is going to recognize it as it's not itself, and it's going to destroy it. And that's what we call tissue rejection. And again, if you, when we get into more immunology later in the semester, we'll talk about tissue rejection, but these proteins are really important for that. And this tells your body, your immune system, not to kill yourself because these recognitions say, yep, I'm me, this is me. Okay. Another type of protein is a receptor protein, and these things bind molecules on the outside and tell the cell to do something. So a lot of times you have these hormones or other chemical signals inside your body that say, hey, cell, you need to make something. And so this thing will bind to the cell and it will say, okay, I'm, you have it bound, turn on the light switch, we'll make this protein or make this thing for the rest of the body. And so that's what it will do. And so this is called a receptor protein. Another thing that you have are called enzymatic proteins, and we're going to get into all about enzymes next week in the next week's lectures, and Jill's going to talk about enzymes. But enzymes help make things go faster or work faster, more efficiently, and so it goes from point A to point B. It's kind of like a little worker, and it speeds up the work, kind of like the power tool of the cell. Okay, And what these things do are drive reactions so that you make things inside the cell. And so these are called enzyme proteins. And we'll discuss that more next week when we get into enzymes. And then finally, you have these tight junction or junction proteins. And what these are act like spacers. So if you ever have seen tile floors, you know you have the grout lines in between the tiles. And they're nicely even spaced. And when they look nice, you know that someone did a really good job because they're nicely even spaced. And you use those spacers when you lay these things out. Well, that's really what the tight junctions do. What they do is they allow the cells to have a nice, evenly spaced uh, cells around each other and so that they're not all crowded together and squished together and that stuff. It also helps for communication and so there's a lot of different functions that these tight junctions do. But think of the spacing of the cells. That's what they're more, more about and how they do those things. Now I talked a lot about these different proteins and now I'm not going to expect you on the test to know all these different types of proteins. I just want you to know that these proteins have a lot of different functions within the cell. So I might just ask a general question, what do proteins do? And you can say that they have a lot of different functions to them. They do a lot of different things. But I'm not going to ask you specifically what does a tight junction do, what is an enzyme protein or anything else. I just want you to be aware of lots of functions that these proteins now do. Okay, so the last thing that I want to bring up before we get into the next lecture, which is transport, is how do things actually move? And really, the way that we look at it is based on what the molecule you're trying to get across the membrane. You look at the size, and you look at whether or not it has a charge. So if you're small and uncharged, you can easily get back and forth through the membrane. Either you pass through the membrane on your own or you use a channel protein or something like that. And that's how most things move. Most gases move. 
move through oxygen or carbon dioxide, move easily through the membrane. But if you're large, like a glucose or protein molecule, or you have a charge, like sometimes chlorine ions or sodium ions, you're going to need help to get into the membrane or get across the, get across the cell. And this is what makes the cell really important or makes the membrane really important because it can regulate things getting across the membrane. We call this semi-permeability. And it's all based on how things are, our molecules set up. And looking at this slide, how semi-permeable membrane works. It allows some things in. If you're small enough or if you don't have a charge, you can easily move through. But if you're too large, I'm sorry, you have to get help to get in or we don't allow you in. You have to get some help. And again, this kind of just shows you again, non-charged, easily move through. If you're small, you can easily get through. But if you're charged or you're large, you're not going to get through. So kind of remember this when we're thinking about transport. Large and have a charge, can't get in very easily. But if you have if you're small and no charge, you can easily diffuse back and forth through the membrane and that's going to be really important. And this last slide just shows you again some examples of how things move and it's all based on how big or how small or if you have a charge. And again, small non-charged easily get through, large with a charge very tough to get through without help. Okay, and so that's kind of the rule of thumb. And we'll talk more about this when we get into transport next time. So to summarize the fluid mosaic model, this means that the membrane is made up of all different types of molecules. You have the phospholipids, you have the proteins, and it makes up a nice mosaic. If you look at the top of the cell and you just look at all the different things that are made in it, it kind of gives you the idea of a mosaic, like a mosaic tile or something like that. So that's where the mosaic comes from. The fluid comes from things moving around, again, Proteins and other things can move fluidly through the molecule or through the cell or through the membrane so that they can get from one side of the cell to the other without having to rotate the whole cell. And so it's really helpful for those things to move. We talked about the various components of the membrane. Again, the biggest thing is the phospholipids and how they're oriented. And they're oriented based on hydrophilic being on the outside, the hydrophobic on the inside. And then you have the proteins with all the different functions. And again, don't have to know all the different types of proteins, but make sure that you understand that they do have a lot of different functions to those proteins. They just don't do one thing, but they do a multitude of different things. And then finally, how do things get in and out? This is gonna be really important for transport. Again, it all relates to the molecule itself. If you're large and have a charge, very tough to get in without help. If you're small and with no charge, you can easily move through the membrane. And that again, makes our membrane semi-permeable. It's very important because we can allow things to get in and out of the cell without any issue, okay? We can allow what we want in the cells and keep things out that we don't want, okay? And with that, that comes to the end of this lecture for this time. If you have any questions, please email me. I'd be happy to answer any questions or if you have any questions during the lab itself. These are really good labs to start looking at membranes and, and looking at the different things that we do in the labs. So I think it will really give you an idea of how things move in and out of the membranes here, especially with the next lecture. And with that, I'll see you next time.